my presentation today is part of a larger project on uh, the, the ethics and politics of the humanities and social sciences, right? So sort of in the, in the, in the spirit of physician heal thyself, I, I think it's only appropriate if we're going around as, as normative theorists judging everyone else and what they're up to. We really need to turn our tools of normative ethics and normative political theory on our own professional practices uh, and those of our colleagues in the rest of the humanities and social sciences. So this project has consisted of, of a series of case studies where I look at the issues that divide us professionally and, and methodologically and, and reanalyze them through the lens of normative ethics and normative political theory, right? So like looking at not ideal and non-ideal political theory as a question of professional ethics. Or, uh, and this is actually quite relevant for what I'll be talking about today, looking at my dispute with, with the people coming out of Cambridge, or I guess now out of Queen Mary, uh, and uh, my, my objection to, to their approach, they call me an anachronist, I call them an antiquarian, uh, their objection to my approach uh, is one that I don't think we can make sense of methodologically, because methodology is a technique for achieving a, a given end. Whereas me and the Cambridge types, we're trying to achieve different ends. They're trying to historically contextualize. I'm trying to make relevant for today. And, and, and what I'm presenting today is an example of that. But I think I have a pretty good ethical case to make. Not that what they're doing is wrong. I don't, I don't think they're doing anything evil. Uh, but rather that the value of what they do is that it makes it easier to do what I do. Uh, so insofar as I will be looking at Weber in context today, I'll be doing so to make him more rather than less relevant to our contemporary concerns. So there's that piece. There's a piece on a debate not so much within political theory, uh, but over in, in, in the, the, the more uh, descriptive areas of the social sciences on uh, causal versus interpretive explanations. And then, again, closely related to what I'm doing today, it is uh, I got a grant from the Spencer Foundation to look at academic activism, and I have a piece uh, already available online on activism and objectivity in political research. And I have to thank you guys uh, because the feedback I got uh, during an online presentation of that paper uh, to to KCL late in the pandemic really did help me improve it and 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 helped. Uh, get it into a decent journal. Uh, so for those of you who missed that presentation, uh, because what I'm working on right now really is, is, is a continuation of, of that under the Spencer Grant auspices, it is, is we're, we're a profession that disagrees on, on many fundamental features of, of our professional role, of our social and political role. And one of, one of the biggest debates right now is between the scholar activists uh, who think that uh, what they do, what we do, is, is a form of, of, of political activism versus the anti-activists, you could call them the scholar neutralists or impartialists, the people who think, like the civil service, like the BBC News, we can debate whether or not sports commentators at the BBC are also covered by this. It's part of our professional role to be impartial and to not engage in political activism. So I look, I look at this debate and, and, you know, I'm a people pleaser, and I, I want to bring uh, some consensus into this debate. So that article doesn't argue that one side is right and one side is wrong. Rather, what it argues is that we can make peace between these two sides in the debate. We can build an overlapping consensus, right? I'm a Rawlsian people pleaser. Uh, and my idea was that if we can agree on certain uh, important and shared but non-ultimate values, we can build our practices around those values. So Rawls thinks that the wars of religion in his very stylized inaccurate history came to an end when we could all agree that political liberalism is something we can all live with even though we disagree on everything else. Uh, I think we can bring a similar piece to the activism wars within the academy, not on the basis of an overlapping consensus behind uh, political liberalism, but an overlapping consensus about objectivity. Uh, and objectivity, uh, as I define it in that article, is directly inspired by Weber. Uh, it's not an article about Weber, but it's an article inspired by Weber. Um, 
And I, I, I say in that article that I'll be defending a form of objectivity defined in a Weberian sort of way as uh, engagement with inconvenient facts. Or I revised Weber because as I thought, and I, you'll now see, I thought incorrectly at the time, Weber had a strong fact value distinction. So I changed that for purposes of that article to inconvenient evidence, right? That we can agree that whatever we believe about scholarly activism, it's very important that we look at reality with clear eyes, that we see reality as it really is, that we don't let wishful thinking uh, or other forms of ideological delusion get in our way, and that we specifically emphasize those features of reality which we wish were otherwise, which are most inconvenient for us. And that can include facts and values and you know, non-factual theoretical analytic claims and all that sort of stuff. So I talk about inconvenient evidence in this article. And, and I argue in that article that that kind of objectivity is compatible with activism. It's not required. Uh, it doesn't require activism, but it's compatible with it. Indeed, it's required for successful activism that an activist who engages in wishful thinking is a bad, unsuccessful activist. And my ar argument for that is again inspired by Weber, and specifically his idea that the most important thing in a, in a political actor is, is the ethic of responsibility. Uh, a, a willingness to, to let reality work upon them, excuse uh, old Max's sexist language, um, and, 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 and to have a certain kind of objectivity, a certain kind of distance, so as not to believe one's own rhetoric, so as not to fall prey to the, the illusions that are easy for those who share one's ideology, but to see reality as it truly is in its most inconvenient features so that one can successfully use instrumental rationality to take those inconvenient features of reality and change them for the better. So an activist needs that clear-eyed objectivity in order to be successful. But then again, so do non-activists, right? It doesn't matter if you're caught up in the delusions of your political ideology or the ambitions of your own academic career that you really want to prove your hypothesis is correct. You really want an exciting finding, even if it's a finding of no political importance whatsoever. So both activist and non-activist scholars need this kind of objectivity. And we can build a whole universe, universe a whole university around practices designed to encourage objectivity, like peer review, like Q&A, uh, even though we disagree on the ultimate value that these practices serve, we ag agree that regardless of whether we're activist or anti-activist, we need these practices to hold us to the mask mast of objectivity, which is something we all need. So I thought this article would come out would show how objectivity is a value that both sides in this debate share, the debate would be over. Hasn't happened yet. Maybe it's not because the article hasn't appeared in print yet. I don't know. Uh, it's still only available in online first view. But the debate is continuing. Uh, so in, in what I'm working on now, I'm taking a sort of second look at this debate. And I noticed something interesting about this debate, that both sides in the debate have their canonical touchstones. No matter how many times the folks out of Cambridge may tell us that the history of political thought is not relevant to our current concerns, both sides in this debate agree in rejecting that, and they both have canonical figures that they quote all the time. So for the scholar activists, of course, the patron saint is Marx. Uh, and every article, every book in defense of scholarly activism has the ritual invocation of the final thesis on Feuerbach, the, the, the quote that was carved into Marx's gravestone, that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Now, as for the anti-activists, their uh, key figure is sort of, you know, surprisingly to me, because he inspired the, the view that I thought could be shared by the activists and anti-activists. But that's not the role that Weber actually plays in this debate when other people are writing about it. Weber is to the anti-activists what Marx is to the activists. And they quote him all the time. There's not one line that they quote 
like the, the theses on Feuerbach, but there is one set of texts, right? The vocation lectures. Wissenschaft als Beruf, usually translated as science as a vocation, but remember, and this is important, Wissenschaft doesn't mean science in the narrow Anglophone sense of, of Naturwissenschaft. It includes Geisteswissenschaft, the humanities, Kulturwissenschaft, Sozialwissenschaft. Um, so really, I'd prefer to translate it as scholarship as a vocation. Uh, but uh, regardless, and we'll get back to that later, Wissenschaft als Beruf and Politik als Beruf. And they always use the word vocation, and they say, we need to keep these two vocations separate. And they cite Weber on that, right? Uh, so now you may have guessed from the title of the talk that I think that that's wrong. And I think it's an important thing to point out as an interpretive matter that the person everyone thinks belongs on the anti-activist side of this debate is actually probably better classified as being on the pro-activist side of this debate. And I think that's, that's a pretty important finding if you want to talk about the impact of our findings, right? But I, I, I realize I'm in the minority here. Uh, and almost everyone in this debate thinks that Weber is on the anti-activist side. And that crosses the spectrum, right? So Weber cited this way in anti-activist books like, like Stanley Fish's Save the World on Your Own Time. He's quoted this way in books about the debate, but that are sort of neutral within it. Uh, social scientific approaches to this debate, like the sociologist Neil Gross, who, who, who uh, analyzes uh, the, 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 the demographic and statistical patterns on it. He quotes Weber as being uh, on the anti-activist side. And it also includes people who are pro-activist, but want to be generous to and to discuss the other side, right? So the key example here that I'll be using throughout the lecture is a brand new book based on her, her Tanner lectures by Wendy Brown, uh, Nihilistic Times, where she thinks with Max Weber. And I'd already been working on this project a little bit when I saw Brown's book had come out. And at first, I thought maybe Brown scooped me. Right? And isn't that always annoying when, when, when someone who's much more famous than you comes up with your thesis before you do? Uh, spoiler alert, I didn't have to worry. Right? But you, you open the book and things look promising. Uh, Brown says, Weber is often held responsible, often held responsible by others for setting 20th century social science on a dangerous and hubristic course of faux objectivity and ethical neutrality, deterring the very knowledge practices required to understand and criticize rather than mirror and ratify the status quo. But this is a reductionist account that ignores much of the ambivalence, complexity, subtlety, and internal intellectual conflict that makes Weber invaluable to think with. So far, so good. Right? But the problem is, in the end, Brown, like Fish, like Gross, endorses exactly the reductionist account that she criticizes and that I, too, want to reject. Her conclusions are that Weber built an unbridgeable moat between the <coughs> academic and political realm with his infamous stipulation of opposites and an epistemological and an ontological hygiene aimed at isolating and insulating these opposites from each other. More than establishing conceptual tidiness, these <laughs> distinctions are set into the field as police. Marvelous, isn't it? I mean, I know Brown's writing style is divisive, probably just a little less so than that of her partner, Judith Butler. I love prose like this. I think this is awesome. Every word of it is wrong, but it's awesome. Uh, now, how do I know every word of it is wrong? Well, anyone who's read a biography of Max Weber, or even so much as skimmed the Wikipedia article about him, anyone who knows the basic biographical facts knows that this account is wrong. And there are plenty of great biographies out there, including uh, one by Weber's widow, widow, I was about to say widow, uh, Weber's widow, Marion who wrote one, a, a really excellent biography of him, and there are plenty of, of others. But just the basic biographical facts prove that Weber was what we would now call a scholar activist. Right? He was, especially in the last few years of his life, he was involved in, in many of the great political events of his time. He was part of the German delegation that negotiated the Treaty of Versailles. You know, a cloistered academic doesn't negotiate the end to a war. He was one of the authors of the doomed Weimar Constitution 
the only non-member uh, of parliament to be on the constitutional drafting committee. You don't write constitutions if you're a cloistered academic, doomed or otherwise, right? So how could you possibly think Weber was doing all this stuff and wasn't an activist? Well, one way, I think, and we have to deal with this, is because you adopt a very narrow definition of activism, right? That's not the definition I'll be using. Uh, I don't think it's the most useful definition to use in this debate. But maybe you're using a narrow definition of activism, like the kind put forward by Iris Young in her, in her great article on activist challenges to deliberative democracy. Really great article, too narrow a definition of activism, right? So in, in Young's account, what counts as activism is disruptive political activity to bring about radical change. So there's, there's a formal requirement and a content requirement. In form, the action has to be disruptive. It can't be the kinds of actions that people usually do in, in boring ways. It has to be excitingly disruptive. And in content, it has to be to bring about radical change. But I, I think we can't adopt that kind of definition when we're discussing, when we're debating scholarly activism. Because, you know, if, if this, let's take a paradigmatic scholar activist like Cornell West, right? The kind of guy we're, we're debating about. Certainly this qualifies as a scholar engaged in activism, right? Getting arrested and beaten up at a Black Lives Matter protest. But I think anyone would agree that this is scholarly activism too. When in a quiet sort of way, you're advising a politician running for electoral office using the standard procedures of running for electoral office. So I don't think Young's formal requirement that activism is disruptive is useful to have in a definition of, of scholarly activism. And if this is scholarly activism, then I think this has to be scholarly activism too, right? So this, this is my, my former friend, Patrick Deneen, um, advising Viktor Orban. Right, so that, that's, the, I, I think we need to get rid of that content requirement that whether you're on the right or the left, you can still be a scholar activist, right? If Cornel West is a scholar activist, so is Patrick Deneen. But you know, I guess he's trying to bring about radical reaction, right? So, but I, I think this has to count, count as scholarly activism too, right? So it doesn't matter if you're disruptive in form it doesn't matter if you're radical left, radical right, or boringly centrist, uh, as is Amy Gutman, the new ambassador to Germany, former president of Penn, former political theorist. Um, as long as you're engaged, actively engaged in political activity and are a scholar, you're doing scholarly activism, as I'm using the term here. So we include West and Deneen and Gutman all these people I knew in grad school in Princeton who've gone on to do wonderful and terrible and boring things. Um, at any rate, um, if you want to know, well, what was Weber up to? Who was his or Bonn or Biden or uh, uh, Bernie Sanders? It was this guy, Friedrich Neumann, uh, who was like Bernie Sanders in that he was largely a failure. Uh, he was like Viktor Orban in certain disturbing ways and like Joe Biden in other ways. So Weber was close friends with and worked with Neumann. Neumann's political program uh, was, he was one of the first people to call himself a national socialist, mm -hmm. but he actually meant it, and his movement had no connection to the later movement that called itself national socialist, in that he was a nationalist and a socialist and a liberal, I should also add. And he was trying to find a way through the, uh, the, the extremes of German politics in his day when rabid reactionary nationalists were arguing against uh, international socialists. Uh, he was never particularly successful in doing so. Uh, if you were going to compare uh, Neumann and Weber's ideology to something that's around today, the thing it's probably closest to is the liberal nationalism uh, that we're familiar with from, from J.S. Mill and then in, in our own time, David Miller and Yael Tamir. Um, I think the main difference is uh, a difference of means and ends, right? So Weber's politics uh, was different from Mill, Miller, and Tamir in that they, their argument for liberal nationalism tends to treat liberalism as the end and nationalism as the means that we need the solidarity of bounded national communities to create the kind of support we need for social welfare liberalism, for, for policies of redistribution and for policies protecting individual rights. Whereas for Neumann and Weber, 
it's pretty clear that nationalism was leading the way, right? That they wanted to make Germany great again. They noticed that the world's great empires were liberal parliamentary representative democracies. They needed buy-in from the entire population in the project of national greatness. And so that meant they needed social welfare policies. They needed freedom of speech for the instrumental reason of having debate uh, when uh, crown dilettantes like the idiot Kaiser were pursuing policies that were actually detrimental to the nation. But if they wanted the nation to be great, they needed liberalism and socialism. Uh, so that, of course, raises the question, you know, when, when someone has the good fortune of dying in 1920, uh, the question that always follows is what would they have done in the decades that followed in Germany? Uh, and and the, there's this massive German scholarly literature on Weber's politics and, and, and his relationship with Neumann. Uh, and the big question, as it always is in, in, in these things, is the Nazi question. How much did these national socialists resemble the national socialists who came later? Or would they have, as, as Weber's student Karl Jaspers argued, uh, would, had Weber lived, had he not died in his pandemic, uh, would he have been the one who could have saved Germany uh, from illiberal nationalism through his distinctively liberal and socialist nationalism? Um, who knows? Uh, I'm not going to try to get into the specifics of Weber's politics. The important point here is just he had one. And he was committed to it consistently throughout his life and active in, in advancing it. And it was a non-issue in his generation and the immediately following generation. Everyone knew Weber was a political activist, right? So like Jasper's book, Polit Max Weber, Politiker, Forscher, Philosoph, is Max Weber, politician, researcher, philosopher, in that order. And a lot of Jasper's eulogy for Weber, and that's basically what this book is, was Weber could have saved us politically had he lived. Not Weber established value-free social science and isn't that great. Uh, and and that, 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 that's the key point to take away here. Now, there, how, could you, how could you possibly think that, that Weber is opposed to scholarly activism when he engaged in so much of it? Well, the one attempt I've seen by someone who really knows Weber's biography to try to make that biography consistent with the thesis that Weber believed in the strict separation of scholarship and politics is, is this book from the 80s by Edward Brian Portis, who was at Texas A&M for many years. Um, and he argues that Weber on one level knew that politics and scholarship were incompatible, but he couldn't resist. The lure of politics for him was too strong, so he engaged in it anyway, even though he knew he shouldn't. Uh, and this led to guilt, led to neurosis, led to his mental breakdown. It's a kind of weird combination of Weber scholarship and Freudian analysis. Uh, you know, the, that Weber knew that there is a deep incompatibility in the personality required of a politician and the personality required of a scholar. Uh, and he tried to combine these two activities in a single personality, and it failed, and he was destroyed by interpersonal conflict as a result. This is Portis's thesis. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of problems with that thesis, aside from the fact that Weber almost certainly inherited bipolarity from his family. Uh, I mean, the whole idea that these sort of intellectual problems can lead to mental illness misunderstands what mental illness is. Secondly, that Weber did go through a period of terrible mental breakdown, as so many of the great people we teach and certainly all of our students uh, have done or are doing. But his greatest period of both scholarly productivity and political activity was after he recovered from that mental breakdown in the last two years of his life. I mean, that's when the moment for liberal nationalism, liberal socialist nationalism looked like it had come. And Weber was both at the height of his intellectual powers and at the height of his political influence, 1918 to 1920, after the war. Um, but I do think Portis gets something right, that uh, not enough Weber scholars have, have emphasized the centrality of personality to Weber's analysis of these things. And, and if we're going to defeat Portis's and, by extension, Brown's argument, we're going to have to focus on personality. And specifically, the case I'll be making is that Portis is wrong, and in Weber's interpretation, the personality required of, of the political activist, the politician, I'm using those two words more or less interchangeably, it, politiker, uh, it, is the same personality 
fundamentally the same personality that's required of the successful scholar. So that's, that's my case, and I'm going to defeat Portis on his own, on his own turf. Right? Now, I'm, I'm just going to go very quickly over what kind of personality is required in politics. Because actually, I think most of the people who I'm arguing with get that basically right as an interpretation of, of, of Weber. We all know that for Weber, he utterly rejected his intellectual granddaughter, Jaspers, his student, Hannah Arendt's romanticization and aestheticization of political activity. For Weber, politics is about results. It's about getting the world to better conform to how you want it to be according to your values. And that's hard, difficult work. In his famous phrase, it's a slow, powerful drilling through hard boards. And the personality required um, in order to successfully drill through those hard boards is, as I've already mentioned, the kind of person who is committed to an ethic of responsibility, who has that kind of objectivity, that kind of openness to reality in all of its inconvenience, and, and who remains committed to their values, to their cause, while nonetheless seeing exactly how much the world fall short according to their own value standards. So they, the, the question is, in order to have this ethic of responsibility, in order to have this political objectivity, how can warm passion and a cool sense of proportion, deep commitment and clear-eyed realism, how can these two things be combined together in one and the same soul? That's the personality question when it comes to politics and the ethic of responsibility. And Weber's answer, is most of the time they don't. Most politicians are not responsible politicians. Most politicians are deeply irresponsible politicians. In nine out of 10 cases, Weber says, I deal with windbags who do not fully realize what they take upon themselves, who don't have responsibility, but who intoxicate themselves with romantic sensations. So the proper personality for the responsible politician is rare and precious and isn't there most of the time, but that's why most politicians are abject failures, because they don't have the necessary personality. What about the scholar and the successful scholar? Does the scholar have the same personality or a different kind of personality? Well, in Brown's view, these two personalities required for these two different callings, these two different vocations, are very different from one another in her interpretation of Weber which, by the way, she rejects, of course, right? I'm arguing with Brown's interpretation of Weber, not Brown's defense of scholarly activism. I'm just saying, Wendy, Max is on your side. You may not think he is, but he is. Um, so she says in her interpretation of Weber, Weber distances these vocations from one another. And the way he distances them is because they have different ways of dealing with, of relating to values. This is her analysis. That she says, for Weber, Values are political. Politics is a field of power and violence. And scientific knowledge materializes only where all of this, power, passion, partisanship, violence, is in abeyance. Now, that's not to say, and Brown does go at some length criticizing people who think that Weber thinks scholars shouldn't talk about values. They should. Va the study of values is absolutely central. To, to, to Weber's scholarship. But in her interpretation, Weber shifts values from the subject to the analytic object of knowing, even as doing so strips them of their visceral and lived qualities and their passionate deployment. So this is what I need to focus on, right? What is the role not of values as, a sub, as an object of inquiry, but values, the values of the scholar? Does the scholar uh, passionately deploy values in their work. Um, and I think they do. And I think the reason why Brown doesn't understand what Weber is saying about this is because my guess is she's never read Heinrich Rickert. Um, and, and there's no real excuse for that. Heinrich Rickert's uh, magnum opus is available not only in a translated but in a wonderfully abridged version uh, by his translator Guy Oakes. Uh, like many German scholars of the time, uh, you know, Marx joked that uh, 
Germans buy their books by the pound, and by that he doesn't mean they use British currency. Um, and, and so Rickert does have a tendency to go on and on and on. Guy, Guy Oakes has abridged and translated it. And if you want to understand what Weber thinks about the role that values play in the scholar's activity, then you need to read uh, Rickert. And, and the reason you need to read Rickert, he was a, a close personal friend of Weber's. Their existing correspondence is really helpful in illuminating what their intellectual relationship was. Uh, but you know, someone as, as knowledgeable as, as Marion Weber says that the key to understanding Max is that he adopted Rickert's kulturwissenschaftlich logic, his cultural scientific logic. Um, and, 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 and so that, that I think, you know, she has spousal authority in, in, in that regard. So a little bit about Rickert and his context. So the context here is the professionalization of the German university in the 19th century and the emergence of what C.P. Snow later identified as the two cultures that shape university life, the conflict between the natural sciences and the humanities. Now, it's important to remember in, in German, both of those are Wissenschaften. Right? So when, when Weber talks about Wissenschaft, he's talking about both of those. But that's not to say that he doesn't realize there's an important difference between them. Uh, and you know, Rickert was one of these Southwestern Marburg neo-Kantians. And their basic problematic, the intellectual puzzle they were trying to solve, was they thought Kant in the first critique had basically provided all the epistemic foundation you need for the natural sciences to work. Uh, but the question is, what is the foundation of, of the human sciences, the, the Geisteswissenschaften, the Kulturwissenschaften, the Sozialwissenschaften? How do they work? Why are they epistemically justified? How are they epistemically justified in a different way than how the natural sciences are epistemically justified? And at the time, there were two basic answers to this question, each associated with a different Wilhelm. Right, so, so there was Wilhelm Diltai, who said the key difference between the natural sciences and, and the humanities is a difference in method, uh, that the basic method of the humanities is, is the method of empathetic understanding, of Verstehen, and he's sort of the key figure at the time, standing chronologically between Herder on the one hand and Gadamer later on, sort of carrying out that hermeneutic tradition. In, in German thought, and defending the claim to knowledge made by hermeneutic uh, empathetic understanding as the distinctive foundation of the humanities, as opposed to the social sciences. But the other Wilhelm, who was Rickert's teacher, Wilhelm Windel, Wilhelm Windelband, pardon my German, had a different approach, right? He, he didn't think that was what was distinctive about the humanities was the Verstehen approach, the empathetic understanding approach. He thought that it was the fact that humanistic topics were what he called ideographic, right? So he, his basic distinction was between the ideographic humanities on the one hand and the nomothetic sciences on the other, that the humanities deal with, and, and history at this time is always the paradigmatic uh, humanities subject. Uh, and indeed, most of the other humanities and social sciences at the time used human, uh, historic methods. So like Weber's training, before, before you invent a new discipline, you always have to be trained in an existing one, right? So Weber was an economist, but not an economist in the, in the way we understand today, in terms of, of nomothetic, scientific-looking, physics-like looking modeling. He was an economist in the German historical school who saw economics as a branch of history. And therefore, he saw history, uh, economics as part of history, history as ideographic. In other words, we're dealing with things like you know, the agricultural output of uh, Eastern Prussia, 1870, uh, and trying to explain that, particular things like that. Uh, we're trying to explain particular historical individuals with named with proper nouns, be they individual or collective. They're still ideographic in the sense that we're looking to explain particular things. Whereas the sciences are trying to find general laws that explain a whole lot of things in general. That's the difference between ideographic and nomothetic. So how do you decide, right? So 
someone is saying we need to adopt a nomothetic approach to this question. We need to try to formulate general laws. Someone else is saying we try to form an ideograph. We need to f adopt an ideographic approach. We need to try to uh, identify everything we can about certain particulars. How do you decide which one of those approaches to take? Well, Vindelbahn's answer is that values have to determine that. Right? That whether a particular line of inquiry should be conducted in an ideographic and humanistic historic or in a nomothetic scientific generalizing kind of way needs to be determined by which kind of knowledge is more valuable to human beings in, in, in our particular moment. Uh, and, and, and so that first question that faces the scholar is one that Vindelbond explicitly says need to, needs to be answered in reference to values. Indeed, he has a more general, very complicated neo-Kantian theory I won't get into that, uh, that uh, it, it argues that truth itself is grounded in normativity of a values-adjacent kind. But I won't get into that. The key point here is just that the key decision is a values-grounded one in the very first act of scholarship, the basic ideographic nomothetic question. And that's basically the insight that Rickert is running with as he extends his teacher's theories in his magnum opus that looks at the limits of natural science and the logic of historical science. Um, Rickert begins with the observation that the universe is infinite, right? A good, a good thing to be, good axiom to start with. The axiom of the infinite, incomprehensibly infinite universe. And the universe is incomprehensibly infinite in two different ways, right? It's extensively incomprehensibly infinite. In other words, it just goes on and on and on forever with more and more galaxies and such. But it's also intensively incomprehensibly infinite. You can always keep zeroing down atomic and subatomic and so on, right? And there's always another level of detail you could be looking at even when you think you've selected out a particular phenomenon from the infinite. Now, the thing about the, the nomothetic sciences is that they try to capture all this infinity with a theory of everything, right? As parsimonious a theory as possible to explain absolutely everything if they can. So he says Vindelbond is right that that initial choice to go generalizing is a values-based choice. But then after you do that, values don't play as central a role in nomothetic science from there on in. But that's not true when it comes to ideographic science, because ideographic humanities. Because in all of this extensively and intensively infinite everything, how do you choose what particular things to focus on ideographically? Well, there's one and only one answer. You have to focus on what matters, right? You have to pick out not just what phenomena, but what feature, because every phenomenon is intensively infinite in itself, you have to pick out what features of that phenomenon you're going to focus on. And that has to be guided every step of the way by your values. It has to be guided, and this, this is the key why people misunderstand Weber. It has to be guided, though, by your values in a very particular way. It has to be guided by what Rickert calls value relevance, Wertbezeichung. Excuse my German again. Uh, a bit of terminology that Weber himself picks up on and uses. And, and Rickert makes a big deal about how value relevance differs from what he calls valuation or value simpliciter. Uh, now, both of these are things that in ordinary language we would call values. But Rickert thinks they operate quite differently. Um, he gives the example, very German example, of Martin Luther, right? Let's say you want to study Martin Luther. That's ideographic, right? Classic proper noun, therefore it's ideographic, right? Now, the valuations of Martin Luther will be very different depending on whether you're Catholic or Protestant, right? The, the, the Catholic looks at Luther and says, Luther bad. The Protestant looks at Luther and says, Luther good. But the value relevance for both of them is the same. Luther is important to both of them. Luther is worth studying for both of them. And of course, Luther himself is intensively infinite. But they're not interested in Luther's spleen 
or, or the follicles of his hair. They're interested in his, his theses. You know, they're interested in his theology because they agree, despite the fact that they disagree on the valuation of Luther, they agree on the value relevance of Luther. Now, both Weber and Rickert contrast this agreement on Luther's value relevance between the Catholics and the Protestants to someone who might think that Luther isn't value relevant at all. And they use the, the very problematic example of the Chinese. And, and I apologize for that. There's a whole monograph, if you want to read it, on the role of the inescapably alien Chinese and, and the role they play in, in Western thinking at the time, the hypothetical Mandarin, very good book. Um, an actual Chinese scholar, of course, will also agree that Luther is important. But this hypothetical Mandarin, we can imagine someone who's just utterly uninterested in Christianity, utterly uninterested in Europe. It's just some boring place on the periphery of the, of, of the, the central kingdom. The, the, may disagree that Luther is, is value relevant even. And, and the, this hypothetical Mandarin doesn't even bother valuating Luther because Luther isn't worth valuating in the first place if he's profoundly unimportant, right? So the key thing is, that when, when people are just reading Weber on value relevance and haven't read Rickert, a lot of them tend to think value relevance is important for Weber, but only plays a role at, at an early stage of the research process when you're choosing your questions, right? You pick an important question, and that's determined by value relevance and hence by your values. But then later stages of the research process, values play no role. But that's incorrect. As Rickert repeatedly makes clear, value relevance doesn't just determine the, the questions that scholars ask. It also determines the concepts and categories that they use to answer them. Humanistic scholars, social scientific scholars, ideographic scholars here. right? So what features of the phenomena you're using to answer the important question are themselves determined by the importance of those features in terms of their relevance to your values, right? So, and, and this is absolutely clear in Weber when he's discussing his key methodology, the formation of ideal types. Now, I don't know how many of you teach Weber to first year students, but when you're teaching them ideal types, you spend all of your time trying to teach them, this doesn't mean morally ideal, right? The, 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 that there's an ideal type of the ax murderer as well as the saint. You know, that, that, that the ideal type of the charismatic leader includes Gandhi and Hitler, right? And, and it's sometimes really hard to drum into uh, first year heads that Weber's ideal type means ideal in the sense of idea, not ideal in the sense of as things should be. But there's still a very, very, very important grain of truth to that freshman misconception, which is that in fact, Weber's ideal types are constructed on the basis of the scholar's values because the scholar's values determine what features of the phenomena being captured in the ideal type are important and what features are unimportant. So yes, ideal types are infused with values, just not quite in the way that, that, that first year students think. Uh, it's also important when you're reading Weber to keep in mind that when he's using valuation or value judgment, He's using it in Rickert's sense as judgments of good and bad, as opposed to the judgments of value relevance of important and unimportant, right? So that when Weber is railing against uh, practical concrete judgments of, of, of phenomena being positive or negative, good or bad, playing a distorting role in scholarship, he isn't saying you either can or should eliminate from every stage of your scholarship, judgment after judgment after judgment of what he and Rickert call value relevance. So what then of objectivity, right? I think a lot of people forget that Weber's methodological essay on objectivity in social science and social policy puts objectivity in scare quotes, right? Weber uses scare quotes a lot to indicate that he doesn't think concepts quite mean what a lot of people think they mean, and objectivity is, is foremost among them. Well, on this question of objectivity, given the centrality of value relevance, I think this is where Weber really breaks with Rickert. He's followed Rickert up to this point. 
This is where he leaves him, right? Because objectivity, and Rickert says this explicitly, is easy for Rickert. Remember, Rickert is a Kantian, a neo-Kantian. So he turns from the first to the second critique and points out there are objective values. There's a categorical imperative. And scholarship remains objective even when guided every step of the way by value relevance if those values are the objective values required of us by the categorical imperative. Right? So very German thing to say and horribly offensive. Who knows from the point of view of Kantian ethics? Maybe the Protestant is right that Luther is great. Maybe the Catholic is right that Luther is terrible. It's at least debatable. It, this, is, this, is not an this is an epistemological rather than a relativist point, right? That, that maybe, you know, Kant himself was a Protestant. He, I think he was pro-Luther. Uh, but maybe the categorical imperative goes the other way. But surely we can know, objectively speaking, that Luther was important. And when it comes to this, Germans of either denomination are correct, and the Chinese of the imagination are incorrect. And we know this objectively, right? And so we follow the objective principles of value relevance to produce objective scholarship. And, and there's a scholar named Guy Oakes, Rickert's translator, who says, actually, most people get Weber totally wrong in exactly the way I'm saying. But that's not something in favor of Weber. In fact, Weber needs a robust categorical imperative and a recursion form of value objectivity in order for his scholarship to be objective. And since we all know, whatever Chris Korsgaard may say, the categorical imperative is bullshit, uh, there are no objective values. Therefore, Weber's scholarship fails for the same reason that neo-Kantian ethics fails in general. That's Guy Oakes's argument. I don't think it works because although he gets a lot from Rickert, Weber is far too much of a Nietzschean to believe in the categorical imperative. He knows it's just the ghost of a dead god. He knows it doesn't work, right? And he doesn't believe in objective transcendental values or value relevancies. To the contrary, he makes it clear in his most Nietzschean passages that after the death of, of, of Jehovah, we live in a new polytheism of warring gods. And each person, including each scholar, including each scholar activist, serves a god of their own choosing for reasons that they cannot justify intellectually. Certainly, they can't justify it scientifically. They can't justify it philosophically. They can't justify it rationally. And indeed, I think a lot of people miss that most of the time, when Weber is talking about the, the separation between facts and values, he, between science and, 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 and values. He's not saying, don't let your values infect your science. He almost never says that. It's a very, very occasional thing. 90% of the time, he's saying, don't think for a minute that science can tell you which values to have. Don't think that scholarship can tell you which of the warring gods to serve. It can't. So that's very important. Uh, but if our value relevancies are determined by our decisionistic existential choice to serve Diana rather than Aphrodite, uh, to serve, he says, the gods of the city are the gods many of us serve. That's his god, is his nationalism. Um, to serve Germany or France, these warring gods. If, if, if scholars serving different gods will have different values, they will also have different value relevancies. And if they have different value relevancies, how can their scholarship be objective? Well, this is where Weber leaves one Wilhelm behind and uses another, right? He, he's a magpie drawing on all the intellectual streams of his day. And just as value relevance plucked from Rickert is a key term in his methodological writings, so too is Verstehen, is empathetic understanding, right? And he thinks Wilhelm Dilthey can solve the problem that Wilhelm Windelwand and his student Heinrich Rickert have created through their misguided neo-Kantianism, right? So in this scenario again, and, 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 and Weber explicitly says the racist things about Chinese people in this, um, he says, although the Protestant and the Catholic may disagree on their valuation of Luther, they can understand empathetically the values they don't share. 
and understand what it's like to be a Catholic who thinks that Luther is bad, even though you're a Protestant who thinks he's good. You don't share those values, but you can understand them. Similarly, one can understand value relevancies that one rejects. So the Confucian scholar, the hypothetical Mandarin, could understand why the Germans think that Luther is important. They could even say, okay, I understand these values I don't share. I understand the value relevancies that lead them to construct the ideal types they do the way they do. I would never construct my own questions or concepts that way because I have a different conception of, of, of what's valuable. But given an assumption of those comprehensible values I do not share, I can see how that the scholarship produced on the basis of those values is valid. And this is the source of Weber's infamous claim that scholarship should be objective even to a Chinese, as, as he says in his unfortunate phrase. Uh, the idea that uh, you may find work built around value relevancies that you don't believe in boring, you might find it pointless, you might find it uninteresting, but you can still accept it as valid given your ability to understand the value relevancies that you don't yourself believe in. And that is the one and only kind of objectivity that Weber is willing to take the scare quotes away from, right? That's the kind of objectivity he's, de he's defending. Um, that said, though, even as you're able to understand the value relevancies you don't share, you still are passionately committed to your own. So, uh, and, and Weber has this very amusing example uh, uh, in, in Science as a Vocation uh, of the scholar who in order to, to, to do his work must believe that the fate of his soul depends on whether or not he makes the correct conjecture at this passage of this manuscript, committing himself to the value relevance of his work with passionate devotion, right? So that value commitment to value relevance is as intensely passionate as any politician's value commitment to a cause. But at the same time, you must not allow that value commitment to cloud your view of reality and the validity of other people's work when they disagree with your value commitments. Is this personality beginning to sound a little bit familiar? Right? Brown says, well, it shouldn't be. In contrast with the ethic of the politician, who must titrate principle, ambition, and responsibility, the only morality that Weber thinks the scholar should have is that of plain intellectual integrity. But that's, I mean, we know that's wrong from personal experience, aside from the interpretation of Weber, right? Who among us in the scholarly vocation hasn't felt the difficulty of titrating principle, ambition, and responsibility, right? The, the, the personality required to do that in the scholar is exactly the same as the personality required to do that in the politician. We both need our ethic of responsibility. So the, that personality is the personality required for both. Now, I, I, I could see Brown making two possible responses to this argument. Uh, one is, yes, there are certain commonalities, but those are commonalities that are common to anyone genuinely committed to any vocation. She says at one point in her book that Baruf vocation, calling, entails near superhuman commitments to selflessness, maturity, restraint, and responsibility combined with passionate dedication to a cause outside the self. Right? So it might be there's no particular similarity between the scholarly and political vocations. It's just anyone with a strong sense of vocation will have basically the personality I've just been describing. But that's just not true. Consider some of the other vocations, right? The vocation of the saint. That, that's a big one. Uh, someone who, do, who, as Weber says, sacrifices their intellect on the altar of faith, right? So they don't see reality clearly. They, they, they give up on that clear-eyed view of reality in order to commit themselves to something that they cannot see. They also are not concerned with the actual real-world consequences of their actions. They're the ones who paradigmatically have the ethic of conviction as opposed to the ethic of responsibility. Uh, and, and although they very much are people with a calling, indeed the idea of the calling comes from religious figures like this, 
they have a personality very much at odds with and incompatible with the personality required of both the scholar and the politician. Or rather more mundanely, consider the personality of the bureaucrat, the vocation which unfortunately most of us have to have most of the time, including unfortunately scholars. And we find it really painful, right? That's when we get the personality conflict because the personality of the bureaucrat fundamentally is at odds with the personality of both the scholar and the politician. The bureaucrat doesn't have to see reality clearly. If they see a feature of reality that doesn't fit in one of their tick boxes, they need to ignore it. That's their job, to ignore reality in that way. They also don't have to have a passionate commitment to any values. Indeed, a passionate commitment to values only gets in the way of doing the bureaucratic job efficiently, right? So whether you're a saint or a bureaucrat, you have a personality fundamentally at odds with being either a scholar or a politician, whereas the personality of the scholar politician, uh, of the scholar and the politician is fundamentally the same. Okay, second objection Brown could bring to my thesis. What about all that stuff that Weber says about not preaching from the lectern in the lecture hall, about keeping science and politics separate? Just look at the text. Isn't there a lot of it? Doesn't, she says, we must take the measure of all that Weber prohibits in scholarship and teaching, diagnosis, critique, and advocacy. Or looking at things from the other point of view, just as nothing is more corrosive to serious intellectual work than being governed by a political program, again, in Brown's interpretation of Weber, nothing is more inapt to a political campaign than the unending reflexivity, critique, and self-correction required of scholarly inquiry. Now, the reason I think that this is wrong is because there is an important part of political life that does require unending reflexivity, critique, and self-correction. It's just you need to separate the rhetoric that politicians use from the way they look at reality. Right? Over on the reality side of things, that's where we need the unending reflexivity, critique, and self-correction. But you don't share that self-correction with the crowds at your political rally. Because you know, when you consider reality again, back in the privacy of the campaign office, that that sort of rhetoric doesn't work. It would be irresponsible to use that sort of rhetoric. But you need to think about the reality of the situation in order to figure out what rhetorical strategies and what other actions will work and which won't. Right? So the scholar activist shouldn't engage in things that sound like self-critical scholarship when they're giving a speech from a podium. But they should engage in self-reflection, critique, that looks an awful lot like what they do in their scholarly career when they are consulting with a politician behind the scenes. And I think a lot of what Weber says about the importance of keeping politics out of the lecture hall is about the importance of keeping political rhetoric out of the lecture hall, right? Because when you're in front of a lecture hall, you might feel like you're at a podium, at a rally, but you're not. What you're trying to do for your students is give them the same sense of reality that you would try to give a politician behind the scenes, right? So never mistake this for this, but it is an awful lot like this. In some ways, what we do for our students in the lecture hall is the same thing we do for our comrades at a political meeting where we're planning strategy in private, right? We're trying to cultivate an ethic of responsibility in our students, and we're trying to cultivate an ethic of responsibility in our political allies. And if we do that, we're serving ethical forces. We're making our students better, more responsible people. We're making the politicians who we want to succeed. And remember, the ethic of responsibility isn't just something we value for its own sake. It's something we value because it's the key to political success. And that, therefore, we need to achieve political success for the causes we care about, cultivate that ethic of responsibility in our political allies. In the exact same way, we cultivate it in the lecture hall or the seminar room or the peer review journal for our students and colleagues, right? But unfortunately, 
Just as Weber complained that in nine out of 10 cases, politicians were windbags, in nine out of 10 cases, scholars are just trying to be prophets in the lecture hall. They're just trying to hear themselves talk. They don't care about cultivating an ethic of responsibility in anyone. So it's very important to realize that when I'm talking here uh, about Max Weber's defense of scholarly activism, that should not be confused with the defense of what most people who call themselves scholarly activists do most of the time. In nine out of 10 cases, they're just windbags who intoxicate themselves with romantic sensations and don't care, behave irresponsibility, and don't think about the disastrous effects of what they're doing can bring about in the world. Right? So it's very important not to confuse a critique of most people who call themselves scholar activists with a critique of scholarly activism as such. So I should probably end there and uh, open things up for Q &A. Uh, and A. And certainly, I don't want to leave you with the false impression that uh, I support Cornell West's presidential campaign. Well, thanks so much for giving the inaugural lecture. This was fantastic, uh, very interesting. Um, and I found myself uh, agreeing with so much of what you were saying especially toward the very end of the lecture. The question that I had uh, is actually at the very beginning, and I'm just wondering if you've set up um, the debate in a way that mischaracterizes Weber's thinking. And specifically, he, he never, it, it's a complete misunderstanding, as you, as you point out, to suggest that he was opposed to political activity. It's just that his arguments about objectivity we're focused on what scholars should be doing in the classroom behind the lectern. Um, and I, I just was sort of wondering, um, much of this distinction hinges on the fact that he doesn't think ultimate ends can ever be, be rationally justified. And I'm, I'm, I was just wondering if the way the talk is set up, it ends in a way where you begin to move in this direction. But isn't it the case that you're that, that it's it's just being it's it's being set up with a slight mischaracterization of the nature of Weber's argument itself, which was n never about political engagement, but he was just making a specific argument about the role that that he thought lecturers should ne should not be in a position where they're advocating for specific values in the classroom. Right. So, I guess what I would say is, and, and maybe I was playing a bit of sleight of hand here, right? It is the case that if the question is, does Weber believe that the best form, the best form, the most responsible form of teaching and scholarship looks an awful lot like and in hence is, is psychologically compatible with, sociologically and psychologically compatible with, the best form of political activity, the, the, the answer to that is a definite Yes, right? So the thing you do for your political ally to help them win is help cultivate in them an ethic of responsibility. The thing, a clarity of vision and objectivity. The thing you do for your student as a teacher in the lecture hall is exactly the same thing. I guess the difference would be that you so it is true that what you should not do in the classroom is something that looks like what happens when you're trying to persuade someone who doesn't hold your values to switch gods and, 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 and start supporting your values. Because Weber thinks that that can only happen through some form of non-rational manipulation. Right? Because, because he's firmly, he doesn't argue for it. He leaves the arguments to Nietzsche. Uh, he f he's firmly committed to the idea that there is no rational basis for the decisionistic commitment to certain values. So he does think that trying to persuade someone who's made a decision one way to make a decision the other way when it comes to their foundational values has to be done by non-rational manipulative means. And he thinks a responsible politician who's genuinely committed to a cause will use those manipulative means from the podium in, in, in the rhetorical conflict. That's where words are weapons, 
rather, that's where you use non-linguistic steering media, right? That's, politics is not the ideal speech situation, and it's irresponsible to pretend that it is. So what, he, what he's arguing against is trying to use your power as a teacher to manipulate your students into adopting different values than the ones you already have. But when you're, when you're at a political planning session, when you're meeting with Bernie Sanders or your local Labor Party or whomever, you're not trying to convince them to switch their fundamental value commitments either, right? You're just trying to get them to see the reality of the situation and to try to pursue the values that you already assume you share through the most rational means possible, right? So I guess, I, I mean, how does a teacher who's committed to certain values feel when, you know, their, their best student turns out to be a fascist, right? As, of course, many of Faber's best students turned out to be after. Luckily, he was dead, so he didn't see this, right? But when your, your students become really effective Nazis, you know you're teaching them the principles of political effectiveness played a role in that. And that's, that, is, that is painful for a teacher. But I guess, yeah, that's, that's, that's the difference. That's the difference is a teacher is an equal opportunity ethic of responsibility promoter, whereas a comrade is a, is a, a selective ethic of responsibility promoter. Yeah. yeah and just really quickly, I, I think the analogy was, would perhaps be appropriate that the teacher is in a position where they're, they're lecturing to students that they should assume that apologies from the term phrase they should assume that they are like the Chinese in various varieties where they do not necessarily share the same ends. But the, the results of the empirical investigations should still be just as valid for students that might disagree about the ends. And that's a distinction that I don't think would exist in the political sphere where you're speaking and advising a comrade. Well, it's, it, it's still, right, it still would because it's useful for your comrade to understand their opponents and those who are indifferent to them, right? Uh, it's useful in the political sphere to have empathetic understanding of difference. And we always, oh, we teach our students in the humanities empathetic understanding of difference, right? You should also teach your political allies empathetic understanding of difference in a way that knowing your enemy is one of the most valuable things you can have in the political sphere. So I think the actual practices, the skills, the personality, right, I'm not saying they aren't different activities. I'm saying they're different activities that are the kind, if you're good at one, you're likely to be good at the other. That, that the personality required in these two different activities is fundamentally the same. And actual scholar activists know that. I mean, there are these right-wing fever dreams about, about left-wing professors converting their students en masse to, to, to communism. But an actual responsible teacher is an equal opportunity promoter of, of, of objective uh, responsibility. Uh, and, you know, Cornel West is quite good at teaching right wing students. And Robbie George and Patrick Deneen are quite good at teaching left wing students. Good. I really enjoyed the talk. I have a very similar question that falls on that. And then I have two fairly in the weeds Weber questions, but might still speak to yeah, the, the, larger stuff. We can dork stuff. out about that. Yeah, okay, good. So the bigger question, I mean, I guess I'm still not entirely clear on what counts as a scholarly activist. And I just worry that you're maybe making your job a little bit too easy by saying that any scholar who engages in politics is a scholarly activist. Because obviously Weber and many people who agree with Weber, you know, who have very stringent notions of objective research and objective teaching, like we're going to object to Milton Friedman advising Chicago on the formation of the Chicago stock exchange when they implanted futures. I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which academics can interface with politics that just doesn't seem to capture kind of what scholarly, the, the figure of the scholarly activist that like Brown is talking about is trying to get at. There's much more someone who like understands their scholarship as somehow being tied to a social movement embedded. So I'm thinking like critical theory notions of trying to bring to consciousness the sort of ideals of social movements, and that's what scholarship should be about in this kind of, and rejecting the kind of fact-value distinction in a hard way is kind of a more fluid distinction. So I just wonder if, like you're, make, like, you're making your job a bit easy by sort of, there seems to be a deeper critique that comes out of Frankfurt School, Wendy Brown. That's not just that the kind of whether scholars should engage in, with the political system, but whether kind of their mode of scholarship should 
in some ways be oriented towards actors and broadly it might not be Jungian actors but more broadly it seems like there's a kind of deeper concern there about like how our how we should understand our scholarship relating to politics that isn't just about whether politician scholars should should potentially enter the political sphere so i guess i'm wondering like what is the scholar is is there a distinction between the scholar as activist and the scholarly activist i guess is one way of thinking about that right so then the two more technical questions so first I just, I mean, maybe it was just a terminological thing, but I disagree with how you're using the term personality in Weber, because I think he, I think you're more using it to ter- refer to like character types. And I think he has a very specific notion of personality as a normative ideal that's different than character types. So like a saint can never be a personality for Weber, right? Because they don't recognize their values as values and subordinate themselves to it in the right way if they take those as objectively given. Like, I think he only really thinks you can be a personality if you're like a Nietzschean, Kantian who recognizes all that. So that was kind of my first, just maybe terminological thing. But I think it kind of matters because he does have an ideal in mind of the personality that like scholars and politicians can be under certain conditions, but like poets, I don't think he really think, he thinks can really be like personalities. That's why he's like, go join, join the George group and become an aesthetic, but you're never going to be a personality that way. And the second thing is, I just wonder, I mean, there's a lot more tension in both of those texts as well that I think you're somehow alighting. Because for him, there's, it's like really hard to hold together the commitment with the objectivity. And so I think he's like, he's trying to trace that tension. And so there's a way in which like the worries that it's, it's, I mean, I think there's a way in which you're sort of making him too much seem like he's advocating for this notion of objectivity rather than sort of unable to actually identify it because of all the tension. So first of all, he says you have to have the ethics of responsibility and the ethics of conviction. You have to have the do, I can do no other moment. But also in, Paul, in science's vocation, he says, look, you work really hard for moments of inspiration, which don't fit in his schema at all. So he says you do all the boring, you have these moments of inspiration that seem outside of it. So is it, I mean, is there a way in which for Weber, it's like impossible to realize this? And there's always a tension. He never quite resolves the tension between commitment and distance, which is why it's this kind of constant existential struggle for him. And then does that mean then maybe it's not actually that you, I mean, there might be some ways in which it's limited guidance if you're just like, we're never, it's, we're all screwed because it's, because you have to do these two things that are fundamentally logically in cabal. You have to have both the ethics of conviction and the ethics of responsibility. And then I start to wonder like, is this actually a correct theory if it's kind of premised on a logically incompatible set of goals? So uh, I guess let's let's go backwards through through the three. I, I, I guess the, the the common thing that the, the the two Weber interpretation questions have have in common is what makes Weber so much fun to interpret is precisely that he isn't a modern analytic philosopher and he is often very hard to pin down and very slippery. Um, and 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 I think okay, well, let, let's take the middle question first. It, as with rationality, as with objectivity, I, I think the best interpretation of Weber on personality is that he's using the word equivocally, right? Sometimes he uses it to mean my ideal of someone who's really got personality, which is someone who has Nietzschean decisionistic commitment and knows it's Nietzschean decisionistic commitment. Um, I think he also, he does not conscientiously reserve the word personality for that. He also uses it in a way that's more like the way we use the word personality in ordinary language. Um, and certainly he's obsessed with the idea of character. As you, I mean, we could stipulate, this is not how ordinary German or ordinary English or Weber's own linguistic usages work. We could stipulate personality is, is, is the normative ideal, character is the generic. Extremely, but he has personality and personality kite. Oh, he uses, so he uses tate for the ideal and kite, kite for kite the. Kite is the ideal. Kite is the more German. Kite is the ideal. Kite is like the Kantian notion of personality as like an inherent. Oh, I see. And then he's lifting that from Kant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Okay. And per, so th- this shows the limits of my German, right? Mm-hmm. But then again, you know, there's German and then there's Weberish, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? That, that, there's ordinary language English, ordinary language German, Weber's weird way of talking, Kant's weird way of talking. Um, no, you're totally right. Conceptually, there exists this normative ideal of, of the real personality and the, the general topic of characterological analysis. 
Um, and the point I was making, I would be happy to change the point I was making in ordinary English to a discussion of the importance of character to Weber. And maybe that would be more accurate. Maybe I should do that to, to, to get rid of. The character he wants you to have in, in, in politics and scholarship is a personality of that ideal type. But not every character that he discusses has that personality. But the characterological analysis of lots of different kinds of human beings and that how they interact with the social niches in which they find themselves is, is absolutely central to his thought and I think central to this question. OK, another terminological thing. So two, then one, then back to three. Uh, Maybe it would be, maybe I'm being a little cheeky and trying to, to do more than I'm justified in doing. Maybe this paper should have been called Max Weber's Defense of Participation by Scholars in Politics. Uh, I think I can be justified as saying anyone who actively engages in political activity is an activist. Uh, I'm, I'm justified in saying that not on Jungian principles, but just you know, the, the way anyone who in, engages in carpentry is a carpenter, anyone who engages in political activity is an activist. That's all I mean by it, right? So part of it is I want us to get beyond this left-right, radical centrist stuff. And, and I want us to be more equal opportunity here and say the thing, same things about West and Deneen and Gutman. Uh, because I think the same question is, it, it, you know, if, if a civil servant in the British system did any of those things, that would not be OK. That would be a violation of their duties to, to impartiality uh, and, and neutrality. Uh, whereas the question is, is it OK when we as scholars engage in political activity? Uh, it is true that the word activism carries you know, a, a bunch of, of baggage direct from Frankfurt. Uh, and, 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 and I don't want it to necessarily, you know, only people who use the word praxis are activists. That, that's, Patrick Deneen never uses the word praxis. And wow, is he an activist, right? Um, so, but maybe we're just talking about a different topic. And maybe you're right. It's kind of unfair of me, because my thesis is easier to defend and I'm hinting that I'm defending a more difficult thesis, but in fact, I'm defending an e easier thesis. Um, point granted. OK, well, the third one on the interpretation of Weber, we can talk about later. OK. Hi, Michael. Uh, thanks. Nice to see you again. And uh, this was very refreshing, actually, dive into a lot of uh, philosophy of social sciences, history of philosophy as well. I have a couple of questions. One on the notion of objectivity, you actually seem to be presupposing at the beginning, and then actually we follow up on Stephen's question to press it a little bit further. So I was wondering why you seem to go with this notion of objectivity as tied to tracking inconvenient truth, so to speak, or facts or evidences, where I thought that one of the ideas behind that, even in a Weberian line, would be actually to track uh, those kind of best available evidence, if you may, irrespective of whether it's actually convenient or not, which is a, a quite a different notion, actually, because otherwise we might seem to be tied to a subjectivist notion of objectivity, which I'm not sure that Weber himself or any, you know, other author involved in this kind of debate would like to subscribe. And the, the second question I had actually following up on Stephen's point, I mean, like, uh, let's let's gloss over hypothetical kind of a definitional quibbles about the notion of a, of activist. But surely, I mean, uh, what would you have to say about the condition of success for successful activism? I mean, is it actually bringing more and more people on board on a pragmatic sense, or is it actually guiding people to discover maybe better available evidence about what is actually the correct view, which would be an epistemic aim? And I ask this because there could be important trade-offs and divergences as to what actually counts to be a successful activist, depending on which of these kind of views you endorse, which would reflect, I think, quite obvious in the kind of debate. Thank you so much. Both really interesting questions. Uh, so uh, on, on the first one, I think there's, there's an analogy here. And pardon those who aren't in the philosophical weeds. And this analogy will therefore be unhelpful to you. But it, it's, it's a little bit like, like Kant's conception of moral worth as opposed to moral rightness. So you know, there's, there's Kant says, you only, your action only has moral worth when it's opposed to your inclinations. And then Schiller has this famous quip, like, I find myself helping my friends because I love them. So I've decided I need to force myself to hate my friends and help them anyway. And then my actions will have moral worth, right? So objectivity as engagement with inconvenient evidence is, is kind of like that, right? 
Object, at its most general, as the word implies, objectivity is about engaging with the world as it really is, uh, objects as they really are. Uh, but when objects are as you want them to be, objectivity is easy. Because you know your wishes have come true. Your wishful thinking leads you to the truth. Rather, the key thing to focus on when you're asking, does person X have objectivity, is do they continue to acknowledge reality when it is inconvenient for them? So it's not that I'm saying, Right? There's a difference between being objective and being a pessimist, right? Maybe I should make this more clear. That someone who's constantly finding every time they look at reality, it's inconvenient for them. Uh, there's something, there, that's a strange and unusual person. I, I've heard Scandinavians are like this. Um, uh, you know, Eeyore is like this. Um, there's, something, there's something skewed about their view of reality. Right, so you're, you're right. It's more that the test of whether someone is objective is whether they engage with inconvenient evidence, rather than that being what objectivity is. I think that's an important terminological amendment, which I'll accept as a friendly amendment. Um, uh, on the second one, I think the standard of success for political activity is have you changed the world to make it better as you understand better? according to the values you're committed to, right? So epistemological change can be instrumentally useful for that. One of the ways you can change the world for the better is by improving people's understanding of what's going on in the world, especially people who are allied to you, so that they can change it for the better. Uh, but yeah, it, it is true that when, when I'm arguing that the character of the scholar and the activist are essentially the same, that doesn't mean that the two activities are themselves the same. The scholar is interested in the epistemic, the activist is interested in the practical, but the epistemic is instrumentally useful for the practical improvements, and therefore one person can and, and should simultaneously do both, but they are they are different. It, it's, it's like that, that discussion of liberal nationalism versus national liberalism, right? One is the ends, one is the means. I'm sure Friedrich Naumann, Weber, you know, Mill, Miller, and, and Tamir would all ally with one another in a liberal nationalist. Let's say, let, the next time you see David Miller, tell him he's a national socialist, but in, a, in an 1890 kind of way, not in a 1930 kind of way. Um, and, and that's, that's something they would all ally in and could all work on together, even though Weber and Neumann see nationalism as the ends and liberalism as the means, whereas uh, Miller and Tamir see liberalism as the ends and nationalism as the means. Similarly, the scholar sees the epistemic as the ends, whereas the activist sees the epistemic as a means. But the same epistemic improvements are, are necessary to advance the goals of, of, of both. And therefore, the, they're, 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 they're two great tastes that go great together, you know, uh, rather than being fundamentally incompatible with one another. But they are different, right? I'm not going to go all the way to Frankfurt and say, you know, there's this one thing called praxis that is theory and practice at the same time. And in some, th there are two things that go well together. That's Weber's view. It may not be Horkheimer's, but it's Weber's, you know. Uh, hi, I'm Charlie. I'm a PhD student in the department. Um, it seems like a lot of this debate hinges on um, the adoption of a certain personality and whether that personality, be it the personality of the scholar or of the politician, is compatible with a certain set of uh, behaviours or, or like a certain set of political activities. I wanted to ask what you think, or does anyone in this debate, be it Max or Brown, think that you can simply have different personalities or adopt different personalities in different contexts, right? So, like, one thing I like, personally struggle with is, you know, in my work, I want to be objective and impartial and realistic about, you know, what I'm trying to do. Um, but I also think that, you know, for me to be effective as an activist, sometimes you have to be 
angry. Like, I, I find it very difficult to be a useful political activist if I'm not a little bit upset about the things that, you know, I'm upset about. Yeah. But uh, that is also a difficult, you know, emotion to manage if I'm trying to see the world sort of in a clear-eyed way. But I do think that ultimately I can... That's not something I have to reconcile as, like, one personality of the, in, in one personality of the scholar. Maybe I can just be different things at different times. Okay, so two different responses that may be incompatible with one another, I'm not sure. One is that I think, actually, you know, read your Machiavelli more. Uh, in fact, best of all is to not be angry but to appear so, right? So you need to adopt a very cool, distant uh, analysis of which of my interventions as a political activist are effective and which are ineffective. I think you probably have a very good case that when I'm engaged in rhetorical persuasion, the appearance of anger in my face, in my voice, in my tone is very effective as, 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 as the pathos part of, you know, pathos, ethos, logos. Um, that's rhetorically necessary. Do you actually need to feel the anger? Or rather, would it not be better if, if to be an activist, you were also an actor and able to put on the anger while at the same time internally always maintaining the, the objectivity that is in, in some sense in tension with strongly actually feeling the anger. So I, I question that premise that, that anger so strong as to cloud your view of reality is necessary for successful political action. I'll grant you the appearance of it may be useful, but maybe not the reality. Second point. Um, I do think there is a possible solution here that we can adopt different personalities in different contexts, right? So the, these findings in empirical psychology that there are no character traits, that it's just situations, which have made the Aristotelian virtue ethicists very nervous, because if there are no character traits, how can there be virtues? Um, maybe that's the way things really are. Uh, it doesn't work as a definition of Weber, though, as an interpretation of Weber, though, because clearly Weber values personality in the normative sense that we were just discussing. He doesn't want people to be like that. He thinks, you, you know, given his, his polytheism, you might think that he's okay with serving different gods in different ways at different times in different contexts. He's actually not. He talks again and again about the one demon who rules your soul, right? He wants you to be a personality. So you may be right that that's the solution that will work best for actual scholar activists. But I think if you're right, then that's not something that Weber would endorse. But luckily, my other, okay, so they actually do support one another. The two responses are not incompatible. Because luckily, Weber thinks the other response I was giving you solves this problem. That, that in fact, the, the, the politician scholar needs one and only one kind of personality, uh, one and only one kind of character, which is a personality in the normative desirable sense. And therefore, everything's cool. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to follow up a little bit on Charlie's questions um, and maybe taking us a little bit out, uh, outside of your presentation and uh, maybe speculate a little bit, because what this reminded me of is uh, Popper's uh, essay on the logic of social sciences, where he by the way, introduces the importance of situational logic, but he also says there is no such thing as a value-free or an objective scientist. And even if there were such a thing, it would be completely undesirable because it just wouldn't find any problems. It wouldn't ask any questions. And it's not really the um, object, uh, objective of becoming a value-free as a scientist, but rather having a process through which those values are then translated into statements that then might be considered as true or provisionally true. Falsifiable. Mm. So is that, um, is that a Weberian imprint into the positivist um, uh, methodology of social science? Well, I, I guess I would challenge the idea that Popper is a positivist, right? So, I, I mean, and there's a problem with Weber too, right? That, that so uh, everything is Talcott Parsons' fault, as we were discussing earlier. And there's this, I think, 
if I, there'd be a whole separate project of doing a, a reception geschichte, a, a reception history, and saying, if I'm so obviously right, why does everyone think I'm wrong? And I think it's because there really are positivists out there in Vienna at, in Faber's time, and then they all fled to America, who really do believe in the things that Weber is imputed to believe. Uh, and when post-war, they're setting up the scientific credentials of social science so that it's eligible to get NSF funding, they decide the founding fathers of sociology are Marx, Durkheim, and Weber. Marx will not mention anymore because we don't want to run into trouble with McCarthy. We'll, we'll celebrate Durkheim and Weber. Durkheim and Weber, in fact, have very different attitudes to social science, and we'll misinterpret both of them. Neither of them is a Vienna-style neo-positivist. Um, but then again, neither is Popper, right? So I, I, think, I, I think under your interpretation of Popper, he's much closer to what I'm describing Weber's views as than he is to his fellow Viennese, Hempel and those sort of people. Um, so I do think this is, this is you, you weren't the peer reviewer of the Perspectives article, were you? <laughs> right, because I had, I had a peer reviewer who said, all, all this is well and good, but what is its relationship to Popper? And I said, I, I sat down, I read a lot of Popper, and Popper wasn't what I expected him to be because I mistakenly thought he was another positivist. Just because he's Viennese, it's an anti-Austrian bias. Um, and, you know, he knew all those people and was friends with them, but he wasn't, he didn't agree with them. He is much closer to what I'm defending here and what I interpret Weber as defending. Uh, and I told my, in, in the memo, I said to the peer reviewer, you're right. This all does look a lot like what Popper really says. But most people so fundamentally misunderstand Popper that if I were to defend that here, the paper would become a paper of Popper interpretation. And that's not what I want to do. I don't even want it to be Weber interpretation. So I did something like I had an end note saying, Popper is kind of like this, but most people don't realize that. Uh, because most people mistakenly believe Popper is a positivist. Weirdly, and it's, they don't even have the excuse that he was Viennese, most people also mistakenly think Weber was a positivist. In his, I mean, how can someone who spends all his time on empathetic Verstehen be a positivist? Uh, someone who says everything is ideal types that exist only in the mind be a positivist, right? There's nothing empiricist or positivist about any of that. It's this weird mix of neo-Kantianism and hermeneutics. Rickert and, 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 and Diltai. Um, and, and Popper is his own weird mix. It's a weird mix I don't know as well, so I'm not confident saying what Popper really meant. But yes, the Popper I have seen looks a lot like this. And maybe enlisting Popper as an ally uh, would be helpful because he too is not the positivist. Everyone thinks he is. No, thank you for the questions.